You are listening to The Evidence Locker. Our cases have been researched using open source and archive materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Some parts are graphic in nature, and listener discretion is advised. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. On Thursday night, the 23rd of June, 2005, there was a festive atmosphere in Innsbruck. It was the end of the semester, and the city's students were all out celebrating. They moved from dorm to dorm. Some went to bars and nightclubs, and they all parted with wild abandon. Innsbruck, a city of just over 300,000 people, is nestled in the Austrian Alps. Surrounded by breathtaking mountains, it has a welcoming feeling. The streets are clean and wide, with imperial-style buildings lining the streets. About 10% of the city's population is made up of students studying at Innsbruck University, which brings a vibrant buzz to an otherwise tranquil city. In the pre-dawn hours of Friday, June 24th, the streets were quiet. The parties had fizzled out, and many students had gone to sleep, knowing the next day would be a long one, battling hangovers while packing up dorm rooms before going home for the summer holidays. But this would be a day no one would ever forget. One by one, students were woken up as news of a terrifying murder spread through the town. A 19-year-old girl, the blonde and bright Daniela Kammerer, was found stabbed to death in a phone booth next to Rapoldi Park in the center of the city. Daniela's friends were shocked and did not understand how this could have happened. She was seen leaving a party at 4.30 a.m. Her bloodied body was discovered at 5. What happened in those 30 minutes remains a mystery to this day. Daniela Camera, one of two daughters of Rudolf and Anne-Marie, was born in 1985. The family was close, and their best time together was when they went camping at the Adriatic Sea every summer. 19-year-old Daniela was heading into her second year studying a business degree in Innsbruck. She called home often, and her parents were familiar with her daily routine and knew most of what was going on in her life. Daniela lived in a dorm and went around the city on her bicycle. Her parents knew that she had many friends, but had not met many of them as they lived in Perbach, about four hours by car or seven by train. 2005 was the first summer that neither Daniela nor her sister would join their parents on their annual camping trip to Croatia, and her parents were a bit melancholic about the fact that the girls were all grown up. Daniela was a focused student and considered furthering her studies in the larger city of Vienna. It was closer to her family home and there were more opportunities. Daniela had not made up her mind yet, but she had the summer vacation ahead of her, and she would be able to think things through then. On the 23rd of June, like many of her fellow students, Daniela wrote her final exam. It was two days before Daniela's 20th birthday, and she was on top of the world. In her dorm room, where she had been living for a little over a year, she got ready for a night of partying. She was beautiful, a petite blonde, with a warm smile and a casual style. On that night, she wore a white t-shirt and a pink miniskirt as she headed out to her first party. The weather was unseasonably warm for an early summer evening in the alpine city of Innsbruck, and everyone seemed to be out and about. There was a festive atmosphere in the town. Many students mulled around celebrating the end of the semester and the beginning of the summer break. Daniela cycled a short distance to a student dorm on Solerstrasse, Wilton, where she spent most of her night. Around 2.30 a.m., she left to go to another party. Reports about Daniela's movements on this night never mention anyone leaving with her, so the assumption is that she left alone. Innsbruck is a safe city, with many students floating around town. It was not unusual for Daniela or any other student to be out by themselves at that time. The second party was in a youth center, where a friend of Daniela's resided. It was late, and there are not many details about her time at this party, other than the fact that she left the dorm on Drahaligenstrasse at 4.30 a.m. She said goodbye to a friend and went on her bicycle, 
never to be seen alive again. Thirty minutes later, as the sun was rising over Innsbruck, a pensioner walking his dog past Rapoldi Park in Brattel discovered Daniela's blood-drenched body on the pavement sprawling out from a phone booth. There was so much blood inside of the booth, it looked like the attack must have taken place with Daniela backed into it and her attacker blocking the way out. Nearby stood Daniela's bicycle, upright with the kickstand down. The pensioner called emergency services, who, in turn, alerted police. We'll take a quick break for a word from our sponsors, June's Journey. There are so many reasons to love the mobile or PC game June's Journey. It hits the sweet spot with the Roaring Twenties murder mystery backdrop. It offers a total escape. It feels as if I am in that world, with June trying to solve the case. June's Journey is not only a hidden object game, although that's the part that keeps me going back for more. It's super relaxing to play, and I love experiencing one beautifully crafted scene after the other. I've already solved the murder of June's sister Claire and her husband Harry Van Buren in their upstate New York mansion. Well, I guess June solved it. But hey, I was there every hidden object and clue of the way. But now, I find myself in Paris visiting June's artist friend, Amelia. I've progressed through scenes like Montparnasse Cafe and Amelia's art studio. This is just getting better and better. Progressing through the scenes earns me coins that can be used to renovate the estate, Orchid Island. I mean, who wouldn't like a maze in their front yard or a boathouse right up on the water? The combination of finding hidden objects, decorating the estate, and all the while solving a murder mystery ticks all the boxes for me. It's a fun escape from dark and grisly modern-day crimes into a romanticized murder mystery world. To join more than 3 million murder mystery enthusiasts and puzzle solvers around the globe, download June's Journey for free from the App Store or Google Play by clicking the link in the show notes. Now, back to today's episode. In 2005, it was a time of reform in Austrian law enforcement. The Gendarmerie, Federal Police, and the Criminal Beamtenkorps Detective Force amalgamated. Changes were official a week after the murder. But both forces showed up to the scene at Rapoldi Park with no resources spared. Police divers searched a small pond in Rapoldi Park and a sewer surrounding the park, but the murder weapon was never found. In fact, there was hardly any evidence to be found. Despite a thorough search of the crime scene, there were no clear clues as to the identity of the killer. No fingerprints, no footprints, no fiber or blood evidence either. For a brief moment, the dog walker who found Daniela's body came under suspicion. Police officers who spoke to him felt he was acting strangely. He was excluded and never came up in the investigation again. His strange behavior was probably due to the shock of stumbling upon a gruesome murder scene moments after the victim was killed. Daniela's parents were already on their camping vacation in Croatia, and police struggled to get a hold of them. They eventually tracked them down and relayed the news no parent ever wants to hear. Rudolf and Anne-Marie rushed back to Austria and went straight to Innsbruck, hoping to find answers about what happened to their daughter. Daniela's circle of friends embraced her family, and Rudolf later recalled that it seemed like a busload of students came out to support them. Once the police tape was removed from the crime scene, friends and fellow students brought candles and flowers to Rapoldi Park, a cross marked Daniela's memorial, located on a wall next to the phone booth where she was found. An autopsy revealed that Daniela had been stabbed twice, once in the back and once in the chest. The incisions were made by a large blade. The pathologist suggested it was probably a kitchen knife of about 30 centimeters. The stab wounds were severe, each one about 16 centimeters deep, and punctured Daniela's heart and one of her lungs. The angles of both cuts indicated that she was standing when she was stabbed and that she fell only after losing consciousness. Her body was left where it fell. The perpetrator did not move her or pose her body in any way. Because of the severity of her injuries, Daniela would barely have had time to scream for help before she passed away. Her arms and hands had one or two defensive wounds, indicating that she did not see the attack coming. She had no chance to defend herself and passed away within minutes. An online forum of locals shares their recollection of the aftermath of the attack. Passersby took photos of the crime scene while the forensic team was still processing it. Daniela's body is still there, and one can only see her back. She was wearing a light-colored shirt, and there was not a lot of blood on her back. It is likely that she was stabbed in the chest first, and only in the back shortly before she died, 
probably while she was making the phone call. Police informed the media that the last number dialed on the phone in the middle booth was to emergency services. It's not clear whether the call connected to an operator or not. But when Daniela's body was found, the phone was not on the receiver, but dangling down. Investigators had many questions about the location of the crime. Firstly, Daniela's mobile phone was in her handbag. It was charged and had calling credits. So why would she stop at a phone booth? Probably not to make a phone call, but rather to meet someone. Her bike was right next to the row of stalls, standing upright, balanced by the kickstand. She was not attacked while she was on her bike, which made a random killing less likely. They had to find out if Daniela saw someone she knew and stopped to talk to them. Or did she arrange to meet someone there who turned out to be her killer? If the first wound was indeed to her chest, she would have looked at her killer as he gave her the fatal stab to her heart. Police strongly suspected that the killer was known to Daniela. The manner of death, stabbing in the heart, is a very personal, intimate way of killing someone. According to an article titled The Psychology of Stabbing, stabbing someone requires manually killing the person. It's a lot more intense than pulling a trigger. The attacker is often releasing a burst of anger, as the physical act of stabbing someone requires a lot of strength. If there's a post-mortem stab wound, it signifies that the killer was close to the victim and had a great amount of rage. To stab a person is a risky method if the attacker intends to kill. Victims often survive stabbings if they receive immediate medical attention. To know exactly where to stab someone and how deep the incision should be, one would need to have some knowledge of anatomy. Could the killer have been a student at Innsbruck's renowned medical school? Investigators questioned all of Daniela's friends and classmates. It was crucial to construct a timeline of her last movements and to establish whom she had met the night before her murder. Daniela left the first party at Solerstrasse between 2 and 2.30 a.m., she left alone, on her bicycle, and went to the second party at the youth center in Dreihaligenstrasse. The bike ride would have taken her about 10 minutes, give or take. At 2.30, friends noticed her at the party. They remembered that when she had arrived, Daniela wasn't really talking to anyone in particular. She was on her cell phone most of the time, like she was trying to get a hold of someone. They had the feeling that she had hoped someone would be at the party, but they weren't. She didn't stay very long and left just before 4 a.m. with a friend kissing her on the cheek to say goodbye. On her bike, it would have taken Daniela approximately five minutes to get to the phone booth on Die Fregerstrasse, but she didn't go straight there. A witness spotted her at the Bugenmeile, an area with many nightclubs and bars. It's not the most reputable spot in Innsbruck, but students frequented its establishments because drinks were cheap and many places were open all night. None of her friends knew why she went there, as none of them were there at the time. It's only a couple of blocks away from the second party, so chances are Daniela went past Bugenmeile on her way to Rapoldi Park, perhaps hoping to see someone she knew. But then she went the opposite direction again, away from the park. She was spotted at approximately 4.30 on her bicycle at an intersection on Kampusenergasse. 10 to 15 minutes later, a witness saw her at Rapoldi Park near the phone booth. The witness was driving along when he saw Daniela at the phone booth, but she wasn't alone. In the booth to her right was a young man with light-colored shoulder-length hair. Around the same time, from an indoor pool across the road, another witness saw a person with shoulder-length blonde hair. The witness could not say for sure if it was a man or a woman. Daniela had long blonde hair, and the witness was confident that the person they saw was not the victim, which means it could have been the perpetrator or a vital witness. Police received another tip from a woman who lived in an apartment across the road. She said she had the window open as it was a warm night. In the pre-dawn hours, she heard a fight between two people. According to the witness, she heard the voice of a young woman and that of a native German-speaking man. But she was not alarmed as it had been a night of parties and she assumed it was probably only some drunken students making their way home. Based on eyewitness testimony, Police released a sketch of a faceless person with shoulder-length blonde hair. They stated that the native German speaker was between 25 and 35 years old, and 1.75 meters to 1.85 meters tall. A cyclist mentioned that she saw someone of similar appearance in Rapoldi Park in the days leading up to the murder. Although it seemed like a lot of information to go by, many people in Austria have blonde hair. 
In fact, a study showed that between 20 and 50% of people in Austria are blonde. So that didn't help much. So the person was tallish, youngish, and not a foreigner. They would have had to take most of the local population in for questioning. Police hoped that if they could find a motive, it could lead them to the killer. But there didn't seem to be a clear motive for anyone to want Daniela dead. She had no known enemies, nor did she have any links to the criminal underworld. When her body was found, she had money in her pocket, so robbery was not the motive either. Her clothing was undisturbed, and the attacker did not appear to be sexually motivated. It is, of course, possible that Daniela did not know the assailant, and that hers was a murder of opportunity. With little evidence to go by, police could not afford to exclude any possibility. Was she in the wrong place, at the wrong time? The location of the murder could have provided a useful clue in itself. Since 2004, Rapoldi Park had become known as a well-visited drug spot. Junkies hung around, and dealing was rife. However, after obtaining more information about Daniela, police were able to squash this theory. Her friends confirmed that Daniela was not into drugs. Also, she had only arrived in Innsbruck a year before and would not necessarily have known about drug activity in the park. Investigators concluded that her being there had nothing to do with drugs. Also, if she was the victim of a random attack by a junkie, why did they not take her valuables? Her handbag containing her cell phone and money was still with her when her body was found. The ear witness said that she heard an argument, which made police wonder if it was a romantic crime, an unrequited love, perhaps. If it was an unknown attacker, would she not merely have screamed and tried to get away? A couple of days after the murder, three retail workers came forward and informed police that on the same morning as the attack, a suspicious person was seen in the inner city. An unkempt man of about 50 to 60 years old went into a shop. His clothes were dirty, and when he brushed up against the store window, he left a trail of blood. Apparently, he wanted to dispose of his clothes in the shop and change into something else. However, the sales staff refused. A cashier claimed to have seen a photo of the murdered student in his open wallet. Police tried to locate the man but eventually gave up, stating that the shopkeeper's description of him was too vague. Daniela's parents never thought that this man or a random junkie was responsible for their daughter's death. They suspected that Daniela knew her killer, that it was someone in her circle of friends or perhaps an acquaintance. They were horrified at the thought that the killer could have sat right next to them. In the days after Daniela's murder, many friends supported them and paid tribute to Daniela. Rudolph and Anne-Marie did not know most of them and felt that the killer could have been hiding in plain sight, keeping up appearances as a grieving friend. Because the person seen near the phone booth that morning had shoulder-length hair, police could not exclude the possibility that the killer was a woman, a jealous love rival, or even a secret lover. However, the one piece of evidence that made them believe it was a man was the ear witness testimony, saying she heard a man and a woman argue. A theory emerged that Daniela was entangled in an illicit love affair, with a married man or with someone in a serious relationship. This idea offered two possibilities. Either the man wanted to end it, but Daniela refused, so he had arranged to meet her and ended things with absolute finality, or Daniela was the one who tried to end things and the man refused to accept it. Some students wondered if she was maybe involved with a professor and had threatened to expose their affair. The affair theories were based on speculation alone. Many stories floated around town fueled by the fact that no one had any idea what happened to Daniela and police did not seem to be making any progress in the investigation. All they knew was this. 30 minutes after she said goodbye to a friend on Dreyhalligenstrasse, her body was found. After she left the party, she cycled around a bit and stopped at the phone booth. It was only a couple of hundred yards from the location of the second party, but it was in the opposite direction from her dorm. Did Daniela go there to meet someone? If someone came from the city the phone booth location would have been the halfway mark. There aren't many landmarks in the park, and meeting at the booths along the road would have been a good spot to avoid confusion. Daniela parked her bike, which indicated she chose to stop for a while. But how did her killer make his way there? Two witnesses saw the blonde man walk near the location, but no one saw him leave. Did this particular man have anything to do with the crime at all, 
or was he simply a passerby? The assailant had the murder weapon with him, a long, solid blade, not a flick knife or a foldable pocket knife. As time went by, stories changed and even bordered on fantasy. Some people speculated whether the murder weapon was in fact a knife at all. With such a long blade and deep wounds, could it have been a samurai sword? Whether it was a bread knife or a hunting knife, someone must have walked or cycled to the scene of the murder through the clean and open streets of Innsbruck carrying a weapon. It would be a hard job to conceal such a large blade, but then again, not entirely impossible. Unless the person arrived by car. Not many students have cars. Most of them ride their bikes and use the city's efficient and affordable public transport system. But with the witnesses claiming the man was between 25 to 35 years old, chances are he wasn't a student. Right in front of the three phone booths is a row of parallel parking spots. It is possible that the killer parked there, got out of the car, committed the crime, got back into his car, and left. If this is the case, Daniela definitely knew the person. They would have agreed to meet at the phone booths at that time, and whatever was between them was profound enough for the person to bring a weapon with the intent of killing her. The obvious question to ask at this point is, why did investigators not trace all the numbers she called that night? Police never made this information public. But later in the case, it was revealed that they had possession of her phone and were keeping a close eye on it. They also said that they had a record of all phone calls made in the area on the morning of June 24th. A couple of months after the murder, an SMS was sent to Daniela's cell phone. Investigators followed the lead all the way to Bosnia. Once they were there, they learned about an acquaintance of Daniela's, a Bosnian asylum seeker called Sinel. It was alleged that he had contacts with the North African drug scene, and he was in Innsbruck at the time of Daniela's murder. He had been incarcerated in Salzburg on unrelated charges when the SMS came through to Daniela's phone. Sinel told police that he was not the one who had sent the SMS, but that it was his friend in Bosnia. Both of them knew Daniela, but he could not explain why the friend texted her after her death. Police never made the content of the message public, but it must have been explosive for them to travel across Europe and track down the sender. Sinel worked as a waiter, and as a refugee, did not quite fit into Daniela's polo shirt wearing Circle of Friends. However, Daniela did know him and spent time with him. The prosecutor in Innsbruck also felt they had enough evidence and that Sinel should not be released from custody. He was due to be released from prison in Salzburg, but was transferred to Innsbruck. Sinel was placed in a lineup, but none of the eyewitnesses recognized him. There was no other evidence linking Sinel to Daniela's murder, and investigators had to let him go. The fact that Sinel was taken in for questioning at all caused an uproar in the migrant and refugee communities. They felt that he was targeted because he was a refugee. He was excluded from the investigation, and police were back to square one. With no new leads, the case went cold. But her parents refused to give up. They kept in touch with the police and never stopped hoping that they would one day bring their daughter's killer to justice. With pressure from the family, police explored more avenues, but still came up empty-handed. Three years after the murder, in 2008, Daniela's body was exhumed. Her mother said that it was more about what was buried with Daniela than about re-examining her remains. Back in 2005, when her casket was lowered into the earth, people threw flower petals on top. Others fared her well with letters or notes. Police were interested in what was written inside. Were they looking for a veiled confession? Perhaps investigators wanted to use the notes for handwriting analysis to compare it to other evidence. Either way, what they found was either illegible or irrelevant. Another five years dragged by. By this time, new phone booths had been installed at Rapoldi Park. If pedestrians and cyclists who were not familiar with the case went past the spot, they would never have guessed it was the location of an atrocious murder. But not everyone forgot about Daniela's case. In 2013, file was handed over to a cold case review team in Vienna. Eight years after her brutal murder, it looked like there might finally be answers. Investigators re-examined the evidence and identified 25 people in Daniela's extended circle of friends whom they wanted to interview. Many of them had already been interviewed in the initial investigation. Still, investigators hoped that with time, 
they would be able to gain more information from those who knew Daniela best. Although Daniela's clothes and handbag were checked for DNA in 2005, it only picked up small traces of DNA that could not be tested. However, with DNA testing methods always evolving, they were able to find skin cells and traces of DNA on the inside of Daniela's miniskirt. The same DNA was found on Daniela's bicycle. The DNA belonged to a fellow student and friend, only identified in the media, as Thomas B. Thomas was the last person to see her alive. According to his statement, they had parted ways on Dreihaligenstrasse. He was the friend who had kissed her goodbye when she left the second party. Back in 2005, his roommate said that after Daniela left, Thomas stayed behind and did not go out again. However, the same witness later said that he could not say for sure if Thomas stayed. He might have left without the roommate noticing. Thomas came from Perktoldsdorf in Lower Austria, the same region Daniela was from. They were part of the same crowd, but not incredibly close friends. He was questioned after Daniela's murder and freely admitted that he said goodbye to her on Dreihaligenstrasse. When police discovered his DNA on Daniela's clothing, they set out to find him. They learned that Thomas was living and working halfway around the world in Australia. Austrian police contacted Australian police, asking their help in locating him. Agents from both countries took to social media and found him. They also established that he was in regular contact with his father, who lived in Vienna. Instead of arresting him in Australia and facing the drawn-out extradition process, they kept an eye on his social media and saw that he was planning on going home for Christmas. Meanwhile, Thomas was unaware that police were watching him. He was looking forward to going home for the holidays. Vienna is arguably one of the most magical places in the world to spend Christmas. Christmas markets, oompa bands, street decorations, the smell of mulled wine. The then 29-year-old Austrian wanted to share the magic of a Viennese Christmas with his Australian girlfriend and introduce her to his parents. He was excited to see his family again, especially for Christmas. However, that was not going to happen. As soon as Thomas and his girlfriend landed at Vienna Sweatshot Airport on Sunday evening, the 22nd of December, a group of police officers were waiting for him. They said they needed to talk to him and took him away. His parents did not even have a chance to say hello, and his girlfriend was confused and left to introduce herself to her boyfriend's parents. Later on, Thomas recalled what he was thinking that night. I thought I was a witness, but then I was questioned by investigators. At first, there were eight officers. Whenever I answered the same questions, they just said, no, it wasn't like that. We know it was you. We're no longer looking for anyone else. We just want to know about the crime you committed. Then I got scared. Thomas was kept at Vienna Josefstadt prison and then transferred to Innsbruck. His parents found out that he had been taken to Innsbruck and had no idea when or if he would be released. His mother and girlfriend traveled more than four hours from Vienna to Innsbruck so they could be closer to Thomas and support him. Police stated their understanding of what took place between Thomas and Daniela on that fateful night. According to investigators, Thomas wanted to have sex with Daniela, but she wasn't interested. He admitted to touching her, which would explain why his DNA was on her dress. However, this was precisely the point his lawyers used in his defense. They had sat on the same sofa during the party, and Thomas admitted to kissing her goodbye on Dreihaligenstrasse. This would explain the presence of his DNA on her cheek as well as on her bicycle. To strengthen their argument, his lawyers sent the samples to an independent lab in Munich for testing. The results showed that the DNA on the skirt was from secondary transfer. If one person is in direct contact with someone, primary DNA transfer occurs. Secondary transfer means that it was passed on through an intermediary, usually an object. In this case, they sat next to each other on the same sofa. This is something Thomas had said from the beginning. To the defense team, the evidence did not prove Thomas's guilt at all. On the contrary, he willingly informed police that he saw Daniela shortly before she was killed. Police realized that the only evidence they had against Thomas was the DNA evidence, and this was not strong enough to convict him. Seven weeks after his arrest, Thomas B. was released on the 7th of February, 2014. His family was relieved to have him home and finally got to celebrate Christmas together, albeit in February. They had hoped they would be able to do so. That's why they never took down the tree. Throughout the entire process, Thomas maintained his innocence. He also made it clear that his move to Australia had nothing to do with Daniela's murder. His choice to relocate was made because Thomas had many friends in Australia, 
and he was able to find a good job. He also pointed out that he did not leave right after Daniela's murder. He stayed in Innsbruck and completed his studies. Thomas said in an interview with Austrian news program, Tema Spezial, that he is also desperate for Daniela's murder to be solved, seeing as he was the only suspect whose DNA was connected to the case. Being a suspect in a murder case, when you know you didn't do it, is not something he wishes upon anyone. After his release, he wanted to speak to Daniela's parents, to tell them everything he remembered of that night and to assure them that he was not the man responsible for killing their daughter. His lawyers brought a lawsuit against the state for how they handled Thomas's arrest. If investigators knew the DNA was from the secondary transfer, they did not have enough to justify an arrest warrant. Experts made it clear that the DNA on Daniela's body was not present because of a violent encounter. Thomas's lawyers argued that police could have questioned Thomas and cleared it all up without detaining him for seven weeks. In the end, he was awarded 22,000 euros in damages, 7,000 euros went to the lawyers, and he kept 15,000. With no further evidence against him, Thomas was allowed to return to Australia. It was like a punch in the stomach for Daniela's parents. They were so confident that he was the perpetrator, but they could also see how his DNA came to be on Daniela. However, they wanted to resume the investigation into Thomas, as it was the closest they had ever come to getting an answer. To them, it was not so much about Thomas, but rather to finally have answers for closure. At the beginning of 2014, another student murder was committed in Kufstein, an hour outside of Innsbruck. Lucille Clabout, a 20-year-old French national, was studying business in Austria. She was killed while making her way home after visiting a friend one night. There were some similarities to Daniela's case. Lucille also tried to call for help shortly before she was murdered. Both victims were 20 years old, blonde, and wore pink when they were killed. Daniela and Lucille both studied business. Both victims were murdered in places that were usually busy, but at a time of day when no one was around. So were the cases related? Like Daniela's murder, Lucille's case remained unsolved for several years. However, in 2017, a man connected to yet another murder, the 2016 killing of jogger Carolyn Gruber in Germany, was also charged with Lucille's murder. Cataline C. received a life sentence for Carolyn's murder. There was no evidence linking Cataline C. to Daniela's murder, and the similarities between Lucille's death and Daniela have been ruled to be pure coincidence. To this day, the murder of Daniela Camera remains unsolved. Her parents have kept her room the way it was when she was still alive. Her mom, Anne-Marie, said, Daniela will never come back, but I am appalled about the investigation. Especially at the beginning of the investigation, there were investigative errors that can no longer be rectified. In a TV interview, she addressed the cold case team directly, pleading with them. It's the worst thing that can happen to you. Find my daughter's murderer before I die myself. World-renowned criminal profiler, Thomas Muller, also had a look at Daniela's case. During an interview with an Innsbruck radio station, he said, In my career as a criminal psychologist, I have analyzed and scientifically evaluated several homicides in Germany and abroad. What distinguishes the camera case is the complex fact that there is almost certainly no proven perpetrator-victim relationship. And if there is nothing here, if someone is just in the wrong place at the wrong time and then something happens, then solving such a case is extremely difficult. Daniela was there, and then she was gone. As the surrounding mountains stand vigil, the case of Daniela Kammerer haunts the peaceful city of Innsbruck to this day. One can only but hope that Daniela's killer will one day face justice and that her parents will know what happened to their beautiful daughter. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. Also visit and like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash evidence locker podcast to see more about today's case. If you like our podcast, please subscribe in Apple podcast or wherever you are listening right now. This was the evidence locker. Thank you for listening. <laughs>